Hello, this is Jim Hogue, and we're back after, gosh, over a year uh, at the house at Pooh Corner, which I came up with, what, 35 years ago or so when I was on WGDR. And uh, so here we are. I keep the name. And your guest today is Daniel Hecht, who is a local author, written s several books. And uh, I particularly enjoyed his first one. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have to keep, I'll have to keep reading your, right. your others. But I wanted to do a little introduction today about writing. And that way, it could even be used, what, what we're saying today could be of much use, I think, to writers, uh, beginning and, and more mature, uh, things that we have both discovered over the years. I've learned a lot from listening to people talk about writing, and so maybe we'll be able to help some of you. And what I wanted to start with is a simple word called vocabulary. Mm -hmm. I've heard other, I've heard critics, and particularly myself, um, are, I, I have a background in, in literature and a rather broad vocabulary. And I need that because without the words, without the vocabulary, you don't have the vocabulary to draw on. That sounds so obvious. But when you're looking for the right word, and often there's one word that's much better than all the other 50 synonyms that you might come up with. You have to have that in order to write. And that builds the phrase, and that builds the sentence, and that makes your writing accurate, truthful, and more interesting, I think. So that background, I'm 76, and I've been learning words. I play Scrabble with a dictionary. <laughs> My friend and I play Scrabble together, but we use a dictionary. Amazing. And cool. I learn a word every week, or two or three words every week. And then I forget them right away because of my age. But the point is, um, I, I have a vocabulary to draw on. And that is extremely helpful when, um, when I'm trying to put together a story. I don't know which of these cameras is looking at me. Uh, there's no red light or anything on any of them, but uh, maybe someone can give us a hint about that, and we'll go from there. So this is the one for me, and this is the one for both of us? Okay, got it. Thank you. Uh, I've been looking over at that beast over there. So in my writing, I strive to find a word that is, I guess you could say catchy, mm -hmm. but most important, accurate. And if it's accurate, it's usually catchy. It, it usually helps move the story forward. And what is the golden rule for writers? Uh, Hemingway, the, the, all of them, they say one word has to follow the other almost inevitably inevitably thank you yeah. that's that's the yeah. word i was looking for and if you can write in such a way that your words seem to the reader to follow inevitably then the reader can't put the book down right. because the reader is caught up in not just the logic but the emotion because it moves it moves forward inevitably uh, because you know the right word in the right place to put in the right phrase and then to build from that. And so you're building something. Flaubert and Hemingway are the two authors I can think of who wrote meticulously. Right. And to struggle, and this is one thing I'll, I'll, I can ask you right about, I can ask you now, actually, is how often do you find yourself saying, What's that word? And, <laughs> and you can't go forward properly. You can write a synonym. The, the, it happened to me the other day with desultory. Mm -hmm. I know the word desultory. Right. I've used it a lot right, even right. when I speak. And I remember learning it from Hemingway, actually. Right. And I just couldn't think of it. And I thought of haphazard. No, that's not it. Random. No, that's not it. Right, right. Um, and finally. It came to me, and that's the only word that would do 
in that particular sentence. He was a desultory contemplation of his birthright. Hmm. It's the, um, it was the um, Attorney General of New Hampshire that uh -huh. I'm writing about here, because okay. he's so arrogant right. that he thinks he can't get caught right. for, for his crimes. And so I, I needed the word desultory because he was out walking after he'd really been caught by, by the hero of the story. The, so why don't you go out and walk around a little bit? So he goes out and takes a walk with, his, with the fixer. And I couldn't think of the word to describe how he was thinking. Mm -hmm. And so anyway, what I'm getting at, obviously, is that a writer has to find that word mm -hmm. because you don't want to compromise with a word that, that doesn't work. Because with that word, it moves forward. Mm -hmm. Properly, so I want to ask you: Do you you, you must have that happen? Uh, it's a huge question, so you may have to bear with me for a deeply contextualizing answer. Take your time. All right. So I actually, it's a good thing you asked that because I actually brought a couple of print offs that I used for my students at, at Champlain College that you might find interesting vocabulary wise. Mm -hmm. um, Vocabulary, liter literature, used to be something of a hieratic discipline. That is to mean educated people read it and use it. Mm -hmm. You know, it was, you had to be literate. You had to have gone to school to learn how to read. Um, and you'll see in literature from the uh, uh, early 19th century and, uh, and, and early 20th century a more elevated Mm -hmm. vocabulary. People used longer words and more Latinate words, words mm -hmm. tending to derive from Latin. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> but then along came the experimentalists, who I would say, oh, uh, Henry James, Virginia Woolf, um, you know, it, it, they're T.S. Eliot in the poetry world. Mm -hmm. They began, uh, to, uh, Eliot was very erudite. But there began, be, uh, language began to be challenged by the modernists. Hemingway was a modernist. Mm -hmm. Hemingway avoided big words. He did. He wanted to have a modern, mm -hmm. masculine, uh, lean, clean, sinewy tone. Mm -hmm. So a lot of what happens is when you are trying to pick the right word, it's not just the right one that says it, but the one that uh, matches your voice. And fits. And fit. it says what you need to be, it conveys information. Mm -hmm also conveys an experience. Mm -hmm. And so what happens with me is I tend to write in a style. Uh, these two books are different. I have eight novels out, and they were all written in third person, except for these most recent two. Mm -hmm. um, they, I, I tend to write in what uh, Flaubert called a style indirect libre, mm -hmm. a free indirect style, mm -hmm. where there's not a narratorial voice. Hmm who talks like God and knows everything. Okay, so it's and not an thought, omnipresent narrative. No, the, the, the style indirect libre is the text actually belongs to the character. Okay. So if, if you were a narrator, mm -hmm. the sun rose, yada, yada, et cetera, mm -hmm. and then the, the, the streets came alive, that could be a narrator. But a, um, a character might give you the same information. The sun was beautiful as it rose, and again came the clamor of the streets. Mm -hmm. That's more through the character. Here. Yes. And what vocabulary would the character use? Okay, well, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I discovered, this is late in life, yeah. I discovered that that's the way it works. Yeah. That, and I, just from reading Hyacinth and Elmore Leonard, yeah. the mind of the character, which is really, of course, the author, but it yeah. doesn't seem that way. And to me, when I write, often the character speaks yeah. Outside of me. The character just starts talking. Yeah. And but even the prose on the, on the page yes. is, is the characters. It is, uh, especially if that character is the focus. And then yeah. you, and, and then later on, the next page, there might be a, a character. A different character. Who is thinking. Yeah. And then the style subtly changes right. so that it's what that person is saying. And I right. discovered that because these characters just started talking. Isn't that yeah, fun? And I loved it. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, go ahead. <laughs> well, so I'm just saying that the, the, the choosing the right word is contingent upon a lot of different things. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. Yes. I, uh, the, other, the main thing is that as you write, I, I write long novels. I mean, I've written eight novels, and they're all about 150,000 words long. I was, this one, my most recent one just came out last year, uh, paperback a month ago. Uh, 
I was going to write a shorter novel. And look, it turned out to be 450 pages. I can't, I can't help mm -hmm. it. But uh, the, the, you pick the words according to a number of different things. One is you just have to sing the voice of the novel. Mm -hmm. It has to, it, the voice is really important. And voice involves what do you choose for your words? Would, uh, she, would uh, somebody describe another character as uppity or snobbish? Mm -hmm. or, would they, or would they choose the word condescending? Condescending is pretty long, isn't it? Mm. Mm -hmm. She's uppity. I just read an interesting, very short little book called The Sisters Brothers. And it's uh, written uh, about, a, a, about a, two brothers in the Wild West. They're killers. They're hired killers. They don't kill people. One of them is sort of a sociopath. It's written in the vernacular of Western language. There are no contractions. Uh, uh, I do not say don't. I say do not. I do not say I'd, I say I would. That's just the style they apparently, mm -hmm. I don't know if they actually spoke that way, but that's where writing was done. But that vocabulary is very limited also for mm -hmm. the most part. You mentioned Elmer Leonard, a great stylist. His vocabulary is about 600 words in total in all of his books combined. Yeah. Really simple, modern, spare, clean, delightful to read musical yeah. language. And the, and the people in it can say, Anything because yeah. it's not Elmore Leonard. Yeah, you know you can say all the words you're not allowed to say, and yeah. and you can have some, you know, jerk, or uh, criminal, just blabbing about somebody else, and it's 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 the character. I'm gonna. I'm I, what I'm doing right now is the, there's another thing which is uh, that's important to me, mm -hmm. which is music. Mm -hmm. uh, and the music of language uh, has a lot of different uh, dimensions to it. Mm -hmm. So that's words in sequence. What word uh, works for the... I probably can't find it. I should have marked it before I came down here. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, well. Well, take your time. I'm just thinking of... I have uh, one, one page in my novel where uh, a cop, a young cop, is talking to a mechanic in Austin, Texas. Yeah. Now, I had to kind of pick that language up from some of the, 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 the author who used to live around here, um, Lamour, Louis Lamour. Oh, yeah, really? I used to live around here. You're yeah. kidding. And, um, Jeez. So I, I had to pick up that kind of style. I've heard, you know, I've watched a ton of Westerns. Um, yeah. But it had to work. It had to flow the way this cop would talk to yeah. his old buddy, the mechanic. And the rest of my book... Isn't like that at all. But you have to do that. You can't, you can't just write the same way you're writing for somebody else right. when you're writing about a cop and a mechanic, neither one of whom right. has probably read, ever read a book. Right. Uh, so. And then there, are, then there are stylistic concerns like, okay, speaking of Westerns, look at Lonesome Dove. Mm. Okay, Lonesome Dove, written by famous I, Western writer. Yeah, I've read that. Yeah. And won the Pulitzer Prize. Why did it win the Pulitzer Prize? Well, I make a point of reading the Pulitzer Prize books. This is what, what means. And I was blown away. I had never read any of his works because I just don't mm -hmm. read Westerns generally. So uh, I loved it. And mm -hmm. part of it was this absolutely unruffled prose. Yeah. It doesn't matter what's happening. People are killing each other. Great sorrow. And the prose never tries to excite you. It says more. Mm -hmm. For example, there's a, a lovely a woman that one of the main characters is has a really she's a prostitute, uh, but she's a yellow hair yellow haired girl, which is rare out west and of, of value. Mm -hmm. She gets kidnapped by a horrible uh, Indian renegade, a mestizo renegade, half Mexican, half Indian, and his band. They're really crooks and criminals, mm -hmm. and and you know they're gonna do do who knows what to her. And as McMurtry puts it. And she knew she was in for a hard patch. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm a nightmare. I mean, yeah, I might yeah. have been tempted to pump it up and just with big words that mm -hmm. describe how horrible it's going to be yep. to be kidnapped by five absolute outlaw mm -hmm. criminal monsters. That she knew she was in for a hard patch. I made notes <laughs> from Elmore Leonard. Okay. I, excuse me. I have done that, but yeah. what I'm thinking of is Louis L'Amour. Okay, Louis L'Amour. Yeah. All the Western expressions. Yes. That Louis L'Amour. Uh, used, I pick, for, I choose them, and in my screenplay I did that a lot. In the novel, 
not, not quite so much, but I get your point. Yeah. You, you have to use the vocabulary of the people that, that you have to use what they would say yeah. when, when they say it, and you still have to make it flow and interesting. And Elmore Leonard, I was driving in my car once, and the, the WBAI in New York, I, was still, I could still hear that. And this guy read something, and I said to myself, that's Elmore Leonard. I'd only read one or two mm -hmm. Elmore Leonard books. But I knew that this paragraph that he was reading was by Elmore Leonard. Right. Of course, I was right, because Elmore Leonard is one of the few authors, writers, playwrights on the face of the earth who I would consider pretty well created an art form. Yeah. Shakespeare created right. an art form. Mark Twain yeah. created an art form, arguably Hemingway. Uh, but he was with a lot of other people who were doing the, right. the same thing at the same time. And I leave to Elmore Leonard pretty much as an art mm -hmm. form. And he's recognized, I'm a mainstream critic mm -hmm. guy. I, I have agreed with you know, Graham Greene, as, as, as you mentioned, Henry James. Yeah. I agree with the history of literature in the, pretty much the order. Yeah. <laughs> now, very lately, they've thrown in all these other people just to be politically correct. Right. So I have to go back 30 years in, in yeah, order to get... Nowadays, we, we, we have to worry about uh, nationality, ethnicity, and stuff. It's very hard for us to focus on aesthetics, even as a, a topic of bearing any merit yeah. or style bearing any, But actually, it's very important. The study of aesthetics is philosophically very important. Yeah. Um, so I was about, so when I'm picking a word, here is something, a couple tips mm -hmm. I figured out. In fact, one thing I discovered is that many of the words we commonly use, if you are still resonant with a halo, uh, you could call it, or a glow, or a penumbra, a shadow of, of uh, prior meanings, and we use them without knowing that they are still embodied with that meaning. Mm. Um, it was axiomatic among uh, modernists for the most part to stay away from Latinates. Latinates sound erudite, don't they? Mm. And it sounds like I, everybody's educated and everybody's of, a, of an educated class and is trying to convey information but not feeling. Well, we're moving over to more to wanting to convey feeling. Mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, the, the ones that win the Pulitzer Prize, like Lonesome Dove, they convey, conf can convey pretty deep philosophical stuff with the most rudimentary vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Not, not you know, 50,000 word vocabulary, but you know, 5,000 word vocabulary. Mm -hmm. um, but here's the thing, it's fun. Our language is full of what I call dead metaphors or fossilized metaphors, if you remember yeah. the term. Here's some that I, I actually began collecting them, and people don't realize when they are using them that they are using a metaphor. Because they're dead. The me they, metaphor is dead. So, so it's been used so often it's enshrined. Yeah, like kicking, Shakespeare accomplished a, Kicking the bucket. Wh yeah, whatever. Kick the yeah. bucket. Yeah, right. Uh, you know, hitting me, that's hitting me below the belt, man. Mm -hmm. It's a metaphor. It, was, it had a boxing derivation, doesn't, yeah, doesn't sure. it? Sure. Um, uh, let's see. I, I have, a, if the camera can see it, I have a zillion of them here. This was c compiled in part by uh, 10 years of, of Champlain College students. Mm -hmm. um, but for, you know, he really nailed it, didn't he? You know, so-and-so in the debate. I mean, no, actually, mm -hmm. they nailed it. There, yeah. There's a metaphor, isn't it? Yeah. Man, and I told him that he hit the ceiling, man. He hit the roof. And he hit it out of the park. He, yeah, and he hit it out <laughs> of baseball as another big contributor. Yeah. Oh, Less yeah. so nowadays. Uh, there's a storm of crit criticism as a tsunami of approval or disapproval, mm -hmm. you know, on and on, turning over a new leaf. Mm -hmm. uh, and it goes, and it dozens of them. So when I use those, I use them carefully, but I want, uh, I mean, I think we've forgotten, I, I probably can't say this word on, never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, this is, this is a community Station with with no censorship. Oh, good. Uh, uh, so it's it's all on you. <laughs> oh, good. It's, it's not on. Uh, but I I can't help being aware of it. Well, I mean, I, I think that for example, we forget that what we call people assholes. We mean mm -hmm. <laughs> a part of the anatomy. But mm -hmm. somebody's nuts, you know, or mm -hmm. they're cracked. Mm -hmm. that, he's cracked. Man. Mm -hmm. You know, playing with fire. I mean, I got a million of them. Mm -hmm. You know. Uh, Loopholes ran into a brick wall. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, you know, just uh, we 
we, you know, we slashing prices, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Uh, and I, you've completely changed the subject without realizing it. You know, I'm an actor yeah. and, a, and a director. And one of my bugaboos th that I hate about directors uh -huh. is, and it's particularly amateur directors around yeah. here, they give you direction in terms of adjectives. Okay. I give direction in terms of metaphor. Okay. I mean, think of the difference. You're, you're putting on, you know, the, here you are on stage and, and your character is putting on makeup. And, and what have I given, you're the actor, what have I given you if I say, he, you're putting on makeup? Do you feel that? Do you, right. you know, if I say you're putting on makeup in a beautiful way, it's just like, oh, it's yeah. awful direction, yeah. but that's what directors do. Right. I say you're creating a masterpiece. Hmm. There's a metaphor. Right. Um, and it gives you a feeling. I mean, I could go on all day with, right. with those kinds of things, but that's what a, a good director is supposed to do. Right. When you give somebody an adjective, you're, that's it, it's over. Right. You're pinning them, and that's it. Right, and right. the actor has to translate that stupid direction, which is very mm. common. I mean, you're not stupid because you do it. You just don't know enough right, to right. do the metaphor. Um, the, the actor has to then translate that almost into a metaphor, if he's a good mm. actor, and and go from there. I'm taking notes, sir. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, well, thank you. I'm, I'm honored. Uh, and it, when, when I'm working with a director who just says, you know, I, I want to see the fear. Mm -hmm. um, or even if it's just a regular verb. A regular verb is much better than an adjective. Mm -hmm. So if you say you're trembling, mm -hmm. um, OK, that, that helps that, that I'm trembling. But if you turn that into a metaphor, right. Um, you're shaking, shaking in your boots. That's a little bit more. Um, this that's not a great one, but it's a, it's mm -hmm. you know it's more it communicates more to the actor. You're shaking in your boots right. than you're trembling. Right. Um, so that's what you. I just went on that rant because you you were talking about the use of, of yeah. a metaphor. Well, it's very, very magical. I think if you listen to uh, speech and if you read good books, you realize, oh, there's this little shadow, parallel shadow, uh, you know, of, mm. of prior, of embedded meanings okay. that we tend to forget when mm -hmm. we're using a term literary, you know, like the word scour. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're, we're, yes. I, I scoured the neighborhood, you mm -hmm. know, from... Right. And that's not even a metaphor anymore because... No, we just forgot. We forgot a, it was. It's a great word, yeah. and it means a lot, but nobody thinks of it as a metaphor. Right, that, that's what yeah, I mean. That's All of these point. are ones that we forget. Yeah. Now, i got another set of uh, interesting vocabulary things. Now, one thing I point out is Latinate sounds educated, elevated, uh, informational. Now, remember, what you're not, you're, you want to convey experience and feeling to your reader, not just information. Mm -hmm. So uh, there are a couple things. I, I, what I, this is a, a far less developed uh, in terms of a list, but you know what onomatopoeia is. Mm -hmm. Onomatopoeia is we typically like use scratch. It. Yeah, well, we bark. B a yes, dog barks. Bark. Yeah. Well, let's see some other words. Sounds like a screech, a screech of tires. Mm -hmm. Screech sounds like a yeah. But there's another spectrum, it basically, means uh, sounding like what the word means. Yeah. Except that there's another thing, and I, I'm in the inventor of this concept and I'm pursuing it in a, in a complicated thesis I will go into. Uh, one day I will write a book called, uh, uh, what would I call it, The Synesthetic Analog. Synesthetic Analog. Um, uh, for some reason, English or Anglo-Saxon words just have more mm. Mm, gut clout than, than, um, than Latinate. I don't mm -hmm. know why they just are. There's some exceptions, but um, uh, they convey a sense, physical sense, or a feel, emotional mm -hmm. feel. Um, for example, uh, a, a word I often ask students to figure out why it sounds like what it is is uh, what's the difference between mud? Does mud sound like mud to you? It does to me. Well, it does now because of all the connections that we have mud. with mud. Mud. Okay, how, and what's the difference between mud and muck? 
Well, I could try. Yeah, well. Um, you have these books called, boots called, that, that are good in the muck. Okay. I think mud is maybe less sticky. Yeah. Than so muck. muck is wetter mud, isn't it? It's mud that pulls your boots off. Yeah, muck. Yeah. It's just a wetter sound, isn't it? Yeah. So there is, and, 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 but it's not, it's actually not, because it's not an adjective, it's muck. Yes. It sounds like muck, even though it doesn't make a noise necessarily. Mm -hmm. uh, here's a good one. Um, okay, here's a, uh, a, 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 a chandelier with thousands of crystals. It's uh, That's or, a French word. Or starts, no, no, but I'm just talking mm. about what's it doing. It's twinkling. Yeah. Twinkle. Okay. Twink Why does twinkle sound like the f little flashes of light? It just I, does. I guess it's, it's our history. We connect it through language, but yeah. we also, I, I agree, it just does. It just... Okay, how about, uh, oh, scintillating. So, scintillating? Yeah. How about dungeon? Mm. Does that and, sound and low and underground? It sounds low and underground, yeah. yeah. Oh, God, I don't know. So anyway, um, there are a million of them. So you try to come up with, here's a good one that is actually, is a lat, total Latinate, which is discombobulate. Ah. Discombobulated. Mm -hmm. it sounds yeah, pretty I, discombobulated, doesn't it? Yeah, and it's common. And we, he was, he came and just totally, oh, it was my stomach, discombobulated. This is Latinate, but it, and it sounds, but it does sound very much like what it is. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is it uses every vowel. Mm -hmm. I, O, uh, U, A, E. The only one it doesn't oh. use is, uh, I think it's the only word in the language that uses every vowel except Y in a thing. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it disorganizes the word to have so many vowel sounds. So it's fundamentally, uh, you know, when something scuttles. Mm. Uh, the boat. It, mm. yeah, well, no, but a little critter scuttles. Oh, scuttles. Or if, you know, the, the, you know somebody, a, a human, mm -hmm. uh, scuttles to the shelter of something. He, okay. Uh, it, it sounds like what it looks like, like what it means. Mm -hmm. You know, there's something tuck-tailed about scuttling, isn't there? Mm -hmm. And he I thought walk. of a, bo a boat right away. Oh, yeah, scuttling Sc the boat. Scuttle the boat. Or okay. scurrying. Maybe scurrying. Okay. You yeah. can hear rats scurrying in the mm -hmm. walls. Scurrying. Uh, anyway, so when you're picking a word, you want to look for the musical elements of the word as well, mm -hmm. uh, or for that little halo of resonance that they have as dead metaphors. Mm -hmm. And once the word, again, the word dead metaphor is itself a, a metaphor, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Alive, yeah. Or fossilized metaphor. Yeah. They're embedded, frozen in place in the mm -hmm. word. I so, remember. Uh, uh, Fitzgerald has a, it's called a, not a living metaphor, a, it's the kind of metaphor that keeps going. He, he, he said the crowd lapped up against right. the, the, like the great water. gas, the, right. the cloud lapped up. Well, yeah. okay, that's water lapping up right. against the barricade, you know, but that's, and again, there's a word for that kind of metaphor that goes beyond just metaphor. Um, I, I can't think of the word. But anyway, it's funny we're talking about words. And right. Think of, but you, that the audience uh, gets, sees the difference between the crowd lapped up against the fence and, and, and a metaphor like he kicked the bucket. Mm -hmm. um, so what you want to do when you write is you want to try to help people see right. what you want them to see. Right. And you can write, kick the bucket, and people don't see somebody kicking a bucket anymore. No. Um, but if you, say the, if you say the crowd lapped up against the fence, and, and you're reading, you mm -hmm. see it. Right. So anyway. Yeah, you could talk about sea of humanity. Mm -hmm. It's waves lapped up the steps of the building or whatever. Yeah. Right. Uh, you would continue the, the metaphor of, of this, you know, mm -hmm. uh, what does it say about that, that all those individuals in their collectivity become a little more amorphous and anonymous the way mm -hmm. that water is indistinguishable from other water. But, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I remember that you, had, you were talking about great changes, I s agree with Hemingway that Mark Twain was the great change in American. Mm -hmm literature because he used common language, right. spelled it 
right. wrong. Or, you know, I yeah. mean, he spelled yeah. it so you could. And it was the vernacular of the people. And he was yeah. saying yeah, colloquialisms and vernacular at the time. That was unheard of in serious literature for the most part. Yeah, I mean, you had um, Bret Hart and a few other yeah. people doing that. But then Twain was the most lyrical. I mean, you read Life on the Mississippi, and my yeah. God, it's pure, it's lyricism. Yeah. And, and the, no, the, what you see, the, the scenes, and uh, so my, Twain could do it all. And he also had the mind to perceive hypocrisy like nobody else right. <laughs> ever did. Oh, he, he was just the greatest. Mark Twain is unbeatable. Yeah. What a lovely, cynical, I, I, you know, I, I've never looked this up, and I swear to God, uh, I don't know, i not necessarily a believer in, in reincarnation, but Kurt Vonnegut has got to be the reincarnation of Mark Twain. They even look alike, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Kurt Vonnegut with this, his marvelous, cynical view of the world and, and yeah. of politics and of human motivations and so on. Yeah. Very I think I read to, about three uh, oh, he's just, novels. He's, yeah. too, he's too good. He's too wonderful. He Both said that very, reading very is, funny guys. Yeah. He said reading is difficult. Yeah. And there aren't very many people who can actually read a good novel. Mm. And boy, that makes people, that pisses people off. Right. Um, I had somebody get really angry at me because I, and she said, well, how could he say that? Oh, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, think about it. And think about reading George Eliot and Charles Dickens. Mm -hmm. And think about how you have to activate your mind. Right. You really have to get, get your mind going yeah, to read that. I'm afraid that it, it might be becoming a lost art. If you think about what uh, writing is, for example, here's this book. It's full of little black marks on a page. At each one a total abstraction, meaning functionally nothing until you've just learned somebody looking at this, what, what is this? Um, they're like little bugs or insects. The art of writing and reading is in, incredibly profound, you know. Um, mm -hmm. I, what is it? It's Broca's brain. The, the, you know, the different parts of the brain have been identified as activated, but I'm not sure we know what Wernicke's area or Broca's area do uh, actually are doing when they light up when we're reading. Um, we live in an era when we are losing patience to attain gratification through deciphering all those little black marks. Mm -hmm. um, uh, my here, here, my sons grew up in a literary household. Uh, I read to them every night of their lives till they're like fifteen and kicked me out because I don't want to be their dad. But I read them everything. I, you know, I you know from Calvin and Hobbes, <laughs> all the way from the Narnian Chronicles to Little House on the Prairie to mm -hmm. Charlotte's Web on up through the complete works of Sh Sherlock Holmes. You know, A. A. Mill. Yeah. Oh. And, and, oh. <laughs> Talk about, it's such a lovely name for a program because I think Winnie the Pooh stories are great works, absolutely yeah. great works. Yeah. Um, and, and you have to read them right, the right way. And mm -hmm. you realize, ah, this is genius, just genius. I just love Pooh, Winnie the Pooh, House at Pooh Corner. Yeah. Uh, now we are six, all yeah. those, they're just brilliant, brilliant stuff. Yeah. But anyway, my sons don't read. My, my one, one son is kind of dyslexic, so it's tricky for him. He can read a blueprint and, and build a landscape from it. But uh, my other son is very intelligent, quite a scholar, but he listens to podcasts. Mm. And he's impatient with what it takes to turn pages and so on. And even among people my age, increasingly I see people uh, dividing into two types of readers, I guess, and I, I fortunately, as a somebody who does a lot of research, mm -hmm. because my novels, some of my novels, yeah, like my first two novels, I probably read two hundred books and interviewed fifty people to, to mm -hmm. you know, uh, to get to learn the subject matter. But, but um, I have learned to do both. I read to extract information, mm -hmm. and uh, I can look at a book, I can, and I can decide. Okay, I'm trying to figure out. I know what my my ne information needs. Is. I can. I can actually speed read, and I did take speed reading in, in high school. Eleanor and, and, Wood? And, yeah, I, I took it. In. Evelyn, Evelyn Wood? Evelyn Wood, is that, is that who it was? Yeah. I can't remember. But in any case, I can look for information, and I can, I can mm -hmm. see pretty well what I'm, you know, what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. uh, reading for information alone, though, is 
Uh, the easiest thing we we do, we can do that online. We can just look, Google it and mm. read for information there. But reading for the experience is different. Reading mm. to be moved, emotionally moved, reading to learn. In the back of your mind, I think one's mind, people who are reading to be moved are looking for mystical answers I, about life, what it means, what's true about being human. Hmm. You know, what's, what, why does you know, one inspects why one gets mad at this point or happy there, why oh, I can't bear to read this or that's such a relief. Why are we going through those feelings? Um, I think we are, all of us, to some degree after uh, greater and higher truths. Um, and I think that's a good thing. But I'm afraid that that art is getting lost. And increasingly, I, I do a lot of reading. Increasingly, I don't see people pursuing sort of higher truths in their writing. Oh, um, it, the, you, the writers aren't going for it. Well, they're not, they're, there's nobody to write for who's doing that. Um, okay. We like to think that, uh, well, there's literary writing and there's genre writing. And I don't believe in, in that Okay. Dichotomy. Well, then I have a question for you. If you start with Chandler, just for the sake of argument, yeah. and you go to Ross, Mac Ross McDonald and John D. McDonald. I don't actually know those two. Pardon? Sorry. I don't actually know those oh, the okay. McDonald's. Sorry. Um, yeah, John D. McDonald was probably the most popular hard-boiled okay. detective writer. Uh -huh. And Ross McDonald, the same. They're very good. Okay. And Rex Stout. Rex Stout, of um, course. Yeah. I get an emotional kick, yeah. I guess, somehow. And I laugh, that's an emotion. Right. Um, and I feel, oh my God, I hope they don't catch that, I hope they don't hurt that girl. Yeah. That's an emotion. Right. But these are hard-boiled novels yeah. where the author is going from point A to point B with a quip. I right. mean, you know, these guys are funny. Yeah, but they're hard-boiled quip, you know, yeah. tough. Yeah, tough. so I, what I wanted to ask you was, Quipping is and then, the <laughs> um, uh, Hyacinth, same thing. Yeah. You learn a lot of emotion. You get a lot of emotion. I've almost cried at the end of tourist season mm. when this, the bad guy sh shot up in the knee. Mm -hmm. he, he can't walk, but he has devoted his life as illegal and evil, if you wish. Right. I don't go to evil with, with what he did. But, but anyway, he gets shot up, and he's on an island, and his goal in life is to save wildlife. That's it. He doesn't have any other concern. You know, people get in the way, they get killed. But he's the bad guy. But he's the bad guy. Okay, so he, that he, gives us some sympathy for the fellow. We, yeah. we rather root for him because, well, he may kill all these other people and be horrible, yeah. but... You don't want him to kill any more people, but you don't want him right. to get hurt either. But right. he's, he's really created some pretty serious... You know, damage. So here he is at the end. The good, the hero, right. is with his heroine, and they they don't want to kill him, right? But they have to leave this island because the the, the powers that be are going to uh, blow it up to build uh, condominiums and right. resorts on this island. It's only about nineteen acres, but they're going to destroy it. Every animal, every every bit of beauty is, right. is going to be gone. And what happens? There's an eagle up in a tree. Hmm. And here's this guy. They, abandon, they have to leave him on the island because he won't go with them. Right. And so the good guy leaves, you know, with the girl. And from a distance, they see this weird thing. They see this guy with one leg, basically, climbing up a pine tree. Hmm. In order to save, the, in order to get the eagle to fly, to fly away, away before, before yeah. the bomb, it goes on. I, and then I was crying. Yeah, right. and I think it. Well, look this at this is Carl Hyacinth. Look at how the, how a number of uh, feats are accomplished with that. Yeah. Now that could be what I, I wrote down a thing here when we were talking about metaphor uh, in stage direction, by from receiving direction, actor receiving mm -hmm. direction. And it is a term I invented again to try and figure out what this is. Definitive gesture. Mm -hmm. and I don't mean a gesture like this. I mean a thing you do or say or react in. in. I always try to get a character to have a, a definitive gesture, often early on. Um, 
in a novel. So you kind of, oh, I got a sense of this being a very sympathetic, compassionate person, let's say. Mm -hmm. Or this person's a bad person. It can't be too simple, like he, a puppy crossed his path and he kicked it. Okay, I don't like him already, you know. Okay. Uh, but a definitive gesture, um, in that case, does a couple different things. One, it defines the character. and We're still rooting for a guy who's going to try and do that. Mm -hmm. Climbing a tree with one leg to save an eagle. We, we are, uh, and developing character sympathy is uh, a really important, yeah. you know, uh, task of the writer. The writer, mm -hmm. I like to think of all of my characters, I, I achieve sympathy for all of my characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, The I, worst have killers, uh, killers, monsters, mm -hmm. bad guys, and so on, I do see them as uh, I, some of the most fun write, uh, p people I've written have been... Mm -hmm. uh, have been bad guys, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but you try to develop sympathy because if the reader is not invested in a character, they're not invested in outcomes. So he kills her, or he, she kills him. Well, who cares, mm -hmm. you know? Okay. Uh, you know, because I don't care about the characters. You don't care. But the other thing that draws together a theme that that gesture mm -hmm. of climbing the tree to save the eagle is the uh, thematic core of the book. Yeah. Uh, this personal integrity versus rampant commercialism, you know, the nature's right to continue existing versus corporate, you know, yeah. whatever. So That's hyacinth. That's and that. then it, and mm -hmm. it, draws it, it draws it all together into very nicely. And that yeah. kind of a neat package is a really, really important uh, skill to acquire. And it can't, you can't do it deliberately. You can't say, hmm, I think I'll figure out a definitive gesture that ties together the character sympathy and the, and the pr yeah. fundamental theme or argument of the book, if you will. Mm -hmm. um, well, Hyacinth also will like say, okay, hold on, everybody, and he'll write you an academic description <laughs> of the pollution of the canal. Yeah. He'll tell you, you know, the, the, the ecology. Right. He'll tell you the biology. He'll, he'll tell you the, the, the fauna and flora. Yeah. And then he'll tell you these mother, these bastards yeah. who have destroyed the canal. Right. And they, they're the bad guys. Right. And, and the good guy is maybe the person who shoots the, right. <laughs> the, the guy from destroying the canal because yeah. the good guys are illegal. Yeah. And the, the bad guys are legal. Right. And he'll just stop the, the plot. Right. And describe this man. And you know the, the bookshop on Langdon Street that isn't there anymore? Oh, yeah. I used to touch out with her. Okay. And um, we you both. The Yankee Trader? The Yankee bookshop. I, yeah, it was the, the Yankee, Yankee Trader bookshop. That was, yeah. Yeah, you could come in with a bunch of your worn out paperbacks and leave yeah. with another hand. I love that place. Yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. And so I was chatting with her about Hyacinth many years ago. And uh, we both loved, we, we both recognized that there's such a part in the book. I mean, some people yeah. just read the book and that's the yeah. end of that. But we knew that he stopped the plot, told us about an area, mm -hmm. and then picked up the plot again. And you right, right. liked it. Right. You know, you didn't feel, oh, what's the matter with him? Why is he doing that? And so I learned from that that you can do that. I mean, Shakespeare did it all the time. Right. But I, I learned from Carl Hyacin that you can actually yeah. be didactic. Right. If you, if you write well, you, right. you can be didactic and do that and stop your plot. And I, I love that, being yeah. able to do that. The, uh, <laughs> well, it, it is hard, but you know, I, I think a friend of mine described uh, my first book, Skull Session, which is a big bestseller, mm -hmm. and it was you know, sort of unfortunate for me, career-wise, that that was the case, but it's so wordy, you know, because I would have to be didactic about mm -hmm. explaining Tourette syndrome in the case of Skull Session, mm -hmm. one of my main characters had Tourette syndrome. There's a neurochemical, you know, neurochemistry mm -hmm. of uh, too much, you know, dopamine in the synaptic cleft, and you know, some basic stuff, you mm -hmm. know. Uh, and so, and similarly, my second book, uh, The Babel Effect, was hugely didactic in that to get to the emotional payoff, which mm -hmm. there was. Uh, you had to wade through evolutionary biology, you know, oh. evolutionary psychology, genetics, mm -hmm. you know, et cetera, games theory. I mean, on and on. Um, but the payoff was there, but you had to wait through this stuff. Mm -hmm. I realized, oh, okay, the world isn't ready for this. I thought smart people would be ready for it. 
I had a, a girlfriend for a while who was a daughter of a famous writer, and she herself was a, a fellow graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop. Uh, and we'd sometimes read the same book together. And she did. She, did I know her? You met her. Yeah, you walked up as hello, beautiful lady. <laughs> Good for you. She was an actress. Here, here we are on television. Yeah, she was an actress. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. had been on a number of uh, uh, sitcoms and soaps and stuff like that. But anyway, very beautiful woman. But she and very smart, good writer yeah. too. But we would read books together, and she would get there, get to the open page, and be frightened. You're such a slow reader. I said, No, I'm, I'm pausing to digest mm -hmm. this part here. I'm not going to quick. On, I'm, I'm exploring my emotions as mm -hmm. I as I read that. I can I can read as fast as you want for information purposes, but I, I slow down. My books are probably designed for slower readers, and I, I'm sure they'd sell better if I stripped away a bunch of. <laughs> well, what you, what you yeah. said about reading for information: the faster you can read, the better you feel. Just yeah. get it. Get what the information. Next? What happens next? What happens next? Get oh out. my! Here he comes. He's going to yeah. kill her. No, oh, she's for shooting. Megan. But oh. I I almost <laughs> you know this book here, political ponderology. I wish I could read it really fast and learn uh -huh. everything. And I want to get it over with because I want yeah. the information. But somebody like Elmore Leonard <laughs> and, and Carl Hyacin, I have to slow down. I have to, my lips have to move almost yeah. to read Hyacin and, and Leonard yeah. and, and Twain and all these people so that I can get it at the speed right. at which they get it, at right. which they say it. Right. I, I love reading out loud myself. I mean, mm -hmm. I read out loud to all my kids. I, I read out loud to my wife. She loves it. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, as, as long as she's willing to listen, I'll, I'll read out loud until my voice gives up. Because it, it gives me pleasure to articulate uh, things as I think they should be heard and mm -hmm. at the tempo they should be heard. But, you know, I'm surprised you're not asking me some more questions about, I mean, here I am. I'm a, a graduate of the Iowa Writers' Workshop. I mm -hmm. won a fellowship while I was there. I taught at Iowa for two years. Uh, and I've written eight novels. Eight novels is a lot of novels, you know. And Daniel, what's your process? You know, I was going to ask you the same. I'm looking over there at your your mm -hmm. book. And what is your process? Because process is a, uh, you know, in some ways it's the chicken that lays the egg, isn't it? You know, uh, mm -hmm. how do you go about doing it? And I well, thought that I was, was a discussion you might want to. I was going to get there. Engage me with. Now that's going backwards. In yeah, that's, our, that's what's left. So that's what's left. Ten yeah. minutes? Oh, God, that's not a lot of time to talk we about can keep process. Going, but, I got, you know, I got another, I when can... you were selling your house, yeah. we ended up going in there. Oh, out in Middlesex? Yeah. Okay. I didn't know it was you. Oh, okay. I figured out it was you because I saw oh. your brother's paintings all over the place. Yes, yeah. okay. But then I saw this room with all these colored lines when a character enters... I, I'm assuming oh, yeah. that's what it was. When a character enters, when a character leaves, like it's, this guy's red, this guy's blue, this, right. all over the wall. And I thought, well, that's a process. It is. Yeah. It's only part of the process. So I'll tell you how I begin. Uh, and I begin intuitively. Mm -hmm. uh, I, just, I start writing. I often have an idea what the end sentence is or have an idea of what it's about or who the person is, but I honestly don't know what's going to happen. That's good. I start out writing, and I, I proceed very intuitively and let the writing carry, let the story tell me. And there's nothing better than having the story come to you and yeah. it's being told to you. And you but, even knew more, what you just said, you know more than I know. When, when I did this, this was like one thing after another without yeah. any idea. Uh, well, look, I often don't know much. So I'm mm -hmm. starting, I'm, I'm this far along, and then uh, I'm this far along, and what you saw on the wall was not something I would do from the beginning. Mm -hmm. I know a, a lot of writers, I, maybe the majority of writers, actually, out, they get an idea for a book, they, out, they outline the plot, they might divide it even to a screenplay thing, three and a half acts and next, you know, scenes. Um, but I don't do that. What I do is I get to about 150 pages, and I realize I have so many details and so many characters so many dates and so many mm -hmm. people who knew things at this point but didn't know them here, mm -hmm. and I can't I can't track that those many things. Yeah. So then I start charting chapter one date, you know what the date was, who does what. Yeah, what I, I did a little of that too later on because I, I honestly you can't manage it, especially in a mystery. This is the first 
No, it's, I would say this is the first fair play mystery where everything is revealed to the reader. This is not. This is a love story. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but the, uh, especially in a mystery where there are clues given yeah. to either the reader and or the police or the characters or whoever, and you've got you to track your clue structure like a yeah. bat out of hell. And it gets very complicated. Wait, did he say? Oh, and how strong should I state? Strong should I state exactly. that? Exactly. Yes. Maybe I. Oh, maybe that's too forward, and, and yeah, everybody and will know. Are they going to get these jokes? Yeah. Or or do I have to back fade it down? Yeah. Just a little, turn down the volume on that clue a little bit yep. so that you know, the reader doesn't. Oh, I know who did it. Um, mm -hmm. Your best bet is if eventually the re you f your reader thinks they know who did it. Yeah. Well, and, this isn't a mystery like that. This is a mystery of how are we going to catch the bad guy who we know. Yeah. At, at the beginning, okay. we don't know if all people connected to him are really bad. Right. Because I've had a couple of characters in that change. I didn't know they were going to change when I started right. with them. But they got this idea on their own, mm -hmm. and they said, wait a minute, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> and I didn't know they were going to do that. And so these characters, you know, they're going along like this, and then they go like this, yeah. and they're going after, yeah. or at least divorcing themselves. Well, they took on a life of their own, it sounds like, a little bit. They what? They took on a life of their oh own. Oh, my God, but, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I, I have discovered a couple of things. When I wrote Skull Session, my first novel, and, you know, I, I, people ask me, how do you write a novel? I haven't a clue. I just start writing them, and eventually mm -hmm. they come to an editor, and I edit them and work with an editor or whatever. But... And they happen. The uh, I've had two lovely experiences. One writing skull session. I was about halfway through, and I just couldn't figure out how to make this go anywhere. I realized there's a whole character missing, and I had yeah. to create a character named Mo Ford, Morgan yeah, Ford. I had that. Happy who is a who is a detective? Yeah. He's a New York State Police detective, and that put me on a whole line of research getting to know New York State Police detectives mm -hmm. and so on. And he he just. Kicked ass. I loved writing Mo Ford chapters. It was great. In fact, he was so popular that I, my third book, Puppets, was entirely about him. Okay. Sort of a prequel. In this book, I was writing along, and uh, the middle of a novel gets boggy. It sort of sags in its own. You get so many details to drag, and plot nuances and character. And this, this person's feeling that way about this business, and here's this other thing that's been introduced. It can get, it's a heavy load to keep rolling. And all of a sudden, what happened in this book was uh, a character came alive for me. Mm -hmm. In this case, it happened to be a detective again, Marlene Solansky. And she just stepped right off the page into the room and wrote her chapters for me. It was heavenly. I loved it. Mm -hmm. I couldn't wait till her next chapter, you know, because uh -huh. she just write it for me. Her voice, her mm -hmm. approach, her attitude, her gesture, her, her cynicism, her... Mm -hmm. Uh, a cute observation, her trickiness, her, you know, mm -hmm. her compassion, her, you know, a bunch of, and so she just stepped right off the page for me. So mm -hmm. the, I have to give Marlene Solansky credit for this book, uh, finishing it off for me. She, you know, she just made it, and the last chapter is her, another chapter with her just mm -hmm. has, uh, un, you know, unwelcome revelations. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, I find that the smallest character, a character that has like, Half a page yeah. in a 250-page book, I've got to make that character jump off the page, yeah. just like I make all the other characters jump off the page. Right. And one huge difference between what you're saying about modern novels, yeah. and I think of Hunter Thompson. If we had time, we could talk yeah. about him. But I'm writing a character, Wilkins Micawber, yeah. right out of Dickens. Right. And I write it like okay. Dickens. Oh, no kidding, yeah. And the vocabulary okay. is structured, cool. academic, yeah. deliberate, right. um, conversational at the same time. He tells yeah. jokes, and, and, he, and he can do other stuff. So I have a couple of pages where he's goofing on these two um, NGO mm -hmm. women, nice, nice people. Mm -hmm. But he's goofing on them because he wants them to think he's a crazy old caretaker mm -hmm. off the wall. Right. And so, so that's that scene. There may be like Dick, well, the Dickensian in the right. Dickens had characters like that. Yeah, you know, Mr. Dick and all these. Right. Um, so, I I think that I got a lot from the Victorians, and I didn't know I didn't know that he wasn't in the beginning of this book. Right. He comes in like page 
30 or 40. Yeah, isn't that refreshing, though, and, when it happens? And he's, a, he's right out of yeah. Charles Dickens. Yeah, what and fun. So I have to do, and then there's the Oscar Wilde stuff right. in there, too. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm worried about the right word following. Mm -hmm. But like you said, it's got to be the right word from that character. You know, one of the, a key to uh, character development is that uh, all people have contradictions inherent mm -hmm. in their personality, yep. Yep. in their life choices. Uh, we are all morally compromised. I do a bunch of things that I mm -hmm. shouldn't do. I wish I didn't drive a car and you know, pollute the world and cause global warming and you know, yeah, mm -hmm. buy from factory farms and a lot of stuff I would prefer not to do. Uh, but I'm compromised and mm -hmm. I am contradictory. I'm a nice guy and I'm not very nice. You know, I'm pretty mm -hmm. nasty. Uh, I am uh, smart and I'm dumb as a stump. You know, I really am. There are areas of mm -hmm. just things that I'm so slow to process that my, you know. Um, but uh, there are a number of ways you embody uh, contradictions in characters. Mm -hmm. the, the great advantage of contradictions in a character is the reader is never certain which side will prevail. Yeah. Suppose uh, somebody is uh, a, a nice person with the best interests of humanity at mind, but also has a penchant for losing their temper and killing somebody, or I'm, I'm making this up. Uh, but the reader is in perpetual uncertainty. So mm -hmm. what's the outcome? What's going to happen here? That uh, is he yeah. going to go over to this side? So that's one aspect of it. Uh, the other aspect of it is just re reality. We're all pretty mm -hmm. contradictory. Well, I've got a sheriff here who tends to be, he drinks too much. He can be a little rough on the, on the wife and the kids, but he can be adoring yeah. and they love him right so i I've, I've got that yeah going in there and and it turns out he's okay and you put the reader on the horns of a dilemma do i love him or do i despise him for his bad parts and that's something we all deal with not just with politicians but with you know yeah uh there are a number of ways to do that uh for example uh here's a contradiction uh there's actually there are a lot of terms for this i don't really use them but i, I ran into this one and i liked it uh, is the uh, dichotomous stereotype. Even for a minor character, mm -hmm. uh, it, there's a, a major character who has a dichotomous stereotype, is in Goodwill Hunting, is, I think it's Matt Damon, is a janitor at a university, mm -hmm. but he comes across a math problem, on, and he <laughs> all his formulae on, and he types, you know, there it is, wow, a janitor who's a math genius, and, you know. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, by stereotype, we mean well. You know, janitors are actually dumb and they're uneducated, aren't they? Mm -hmm. That's the stereotype. But he's he has two sides. Mm -hmm. He's actually a janitor and he's a math genius, or you know, and so yeah. on. So here's a horrible. Uh, I mean, make a horrible stereotype. A horrible Southern Bubba sheriff. You know, is racist shit and does all this stuff. Mm -hmm. Except that he also happens to. I don't know, raise pigeons and adores his pigeons, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, We've got 10 seconds left. Okay, quick, say so, everything so meaningful. Daniel Hecht <laughs> <laughs> and, and Jim Hogue, The House at Pooh Corner. <laughs> and we've been talking about really novels rather than, you know, any other kind yeah, of writing, literature but... for this. So I guess uh, thank you for watching. <laughs>